She's got a ridiculous hat on her head. Why does she think that people will come up with looks nice? When old women see me, they frequently respond like this. Hello, my name is Monica, and I'm not some sort of sloppy doll. I've also never put anyone's head on my body. This is genuinely my head. Is it my body in someone else's head, or vice versa? Let's work out things together, shall we? These are images from my childhood. Do you notice any parallels between the past and the present? Aren't there a lot of parallels? But it's not only my head that's the same. Everything below my neck is the work of others. It isn't mine, but some of the other girls, and it isn't a joke. Perhaps you believe I had such a highness procedure as a result of a sickness. However, this is not the case. In reality, I've always been a perfectly healthy and energetic girl. I played tennis, went to a prestigious school, and planned to go to a very fancy college. My parents were proud of me, and every day they were glad that they had such a cool daughter, clever, beautiful, and excellent student. Yes, I was delighted with myself, and nothing, absolutely nothing seemed to spell trouble. But on February 18, 2019, something happened that day. Yes, I was delighted with myself, and nothing, absolutely nothing seemed to spell trouble. But on February 18, 2019, something awful happened that day that will always be considered the most terrible day in the history of our family. I went for a morning walk to re-energize and felt renewed with enough positive energy to last at least until the evening. This was a regular occurrence in my life. I was in a good mood and had a lot of hopes for the future because I knew my life was just getting started. I was walking through a park that was completely devoid of people, and then Julia, my former tennis partner, strolled right into my path. I was overjoyed to see her and greeted her warmly, but she didn't appear to share my good feelings since she blocked my path and scowled at me as if it had done something wrong to her. But she didn't appear to share my good feelings since she blocked my path and scowled at me as if I had done something wrong to her. Three months prior, something unpleasant had occurred between Julia and myself. I'd completely forgotten about it, but she, it seems, didn't. The issue was that she began to slip in tennis, and a lot of the best tennis players in the clubs started treating her like an outsider. And then I became the front runner. The issue was that she began to slip in tennis, and a lot of the best tennis players in the club started treating her like she was an outsider. And then I became the front runner. This infuriated Julia, especially when I was sent to the match that she had spent over a year preparing for. She appeared to have come to the woodland to discuss it, but the chat was cut short when I felt a severe pain in my neck. The following second, it was the kind of agony I couldn't bear, and I wanted to scream with all my strength, but couldn't. The ache then subsided, leaving me with a peculiar sense of weightlessness and peace. A chilly air blew over me, and I was surrounded by darkness. It was unusual, but I didn't care. I didn't want to know what had happened to me or where I had gone. I was just in a great state of ecstasy and tranquility. The water then began to carry me off into the distance, which was also really enjoyable. As I flew forward for some time, I noticed that I flew out of the darkness into some bright corridor. There was a bright white light, but it didn't blind me at all. It was also pleasant and seemed to caress me, and I flew forward along. I didn't care where, I just wanted it to never end. At some point, I began to hear people screaming. I didn't understand why they were screaming. Their voices were so far away that they didn't bother me at all. But when I started feeling pain in my neck again, all traces of the former calmness and peace were gone. I wanted to scream again. I wanted to scream and cry again, but I couldn't. Except for my neck, I had no sensation in any area of my body. There was just one thing that come to mind. It will soon be finished. This tragedy couldn't go on indefinitely. I opened my eyes after a while and found myself in the intensive care unit. Many doctors were standing around me, discussing about me and taking notes. I was terrified since they were so furious and serious. I was also terrified since my head was acting erratically and my neck was hurting. They must have seen my distress because I felt a prick that softened the agony and made my mind foggy and cloudy. Something unusual was occurring to my body, 
and I soon realized it. I was unable to move in any way. That is, I was completely paralyzed, and this puzzled me. How was I here? What happened to me? My memory was completely blank, and I realized that nothing made sense. I wanted to know something at least, but the doctors didn't tell me anything. I was kept in this state for a very long time. After I was finally transferred to an ordinary ward, I learned the monstrous truth. It turned out that on the day when I went on that fatal morning walk, I was found by random passerbys with a broken neck and practically no signs of life. However, the physicians who arrived on the scene determined that I was alive and transported me to the hospital in hopes that I could be saved there. The physician simply shrugged and stated that there was no way, but thankfully there was one mad doctor among them who stated he was willing to risk everything and try to transplant my head, which was completely unharmed. That is, he decided to take my head, which could no longer be considered a part of my body, and attach it to the body of someone else and my parents had no choice but to consent to the procedure. It'd have to be a miracle. There was a .001%. I was filled with dread when I learned about it. What my head was resting on wasn't mine? How was it? And what should I do now, if I can't control it at all? God, what a nightmare. And where is my body from now? The doctors didn't let me panic, though. They gave me an injection of a strong sedative. That made things seem less scary for a moment. At least fortunately, after a couple of weeks, I gradually began to fill my new body and even started wiggling my fingers. And I also remembered everything that happened before the tragedy. I had no doubt that this was all her handiwork. So of course, I told the police about it. They've been interested in what happened to me for a long time And I was sure that my former tennis court partner either hit me on the neck or maybe just tried to unscrew my head. I wanted her to be punished as soon as possible. I had a long way to go on the road to rehabilitation, but the chances of a successful outcome began to increase with microscopic steps. I could still die at any moment because at least 90% of me was no longer me. And so there was no question of me being discharged from the hospital for at least another six months. Slowly but surely, I began to master my new body. First, my fingers began to move, and then I began to bend my arms and legs. I eventually sat down after four months and then got up. By the time I was discharged, I could already walk for lengthy periods without assistance. They kept mirrors hidden from me and took care of everything. As a result, I couldn't see myself below the neck, but by the time I got home, it was worthless to try to hide my reflection. I was once again terrified when I first saw my new body. This body didn't even come close to fitting my head. It was fragile and unathletic in comparison to the real me. The limbs were long and the head appeared to be quite enormous in comparison to the rest of the body. It was all a load of crap. I morphed into an unintelligible and uncomfortable creature from a gorgeous, athletic girl. I started crying and even expressed regret that they had saved me. It was preferable to live as a freak than to be nothing. Another half a year was spent on being depressed and just trying to come to like my new body, or at least just stop hating it, and then I decided it was time to pull myself together. I remembered how much I loved life and how positive I was before the tragedy. So first of all, I went back to my morning walks in the park, and then I began to train again. And after a couple months, my body began to respond. It started to become more fit and slender. It was very different from what I was used to. I even started to like myself in my head. But yeah, it doesn't really match my body. So the most important thing is that I can continue to live in this world and that I managed to cheat death. It took the police a long time to investigate my case and Julia was taken into custody. However, a year and a half after the tragedy, additional information became available. Julia had happened to run into me in the park on the fateful day and decided to take advantage of the opportunity to speak with me one-on-one. She intended to tell me all she thought about me, but she would never attack me. Nature, on the other hand, had different ideas, and Julia was shocked to see that one of the trees had broken by a gust of wind. It came crashing down on top of me. She attempted to save me, but my hand slipped from hers and the tree slammed into my neck, breaking it. Julia became terrified and, in a condition of shock, fled the scene. What happened wasn't her fault, 
and it turns out that she wasted a lot of time in prison. I felt really ashamed that she had to go through this, and I decided to meet with her and ask for forgiveness. She also apologized and said that she really blamed herself for not being able to save me from what happened. She also said that she recognizes my talent and that I really am the best at tennis. Well, I was, after all. Tennis is just a hobby. I can never become the front runner again. Do you think Julia was responsible for what happened? Write your answers in the comments. Like and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss another new interesting story when it comes out tomorrow. Don't you think so? This snot and continuous sneezing has gotten to me. My room is already bursting at the seams with used Kleenex. I'm in desperate need of some new ones right now. Vincent, where have you gone? Oh no, I'm about to suffocate. Allergies are a pain. Due to them, I couldn't see anything because of the tears in my eyes. Vincent came running in five minutes later. I took what he handed me and began blowing my nose. My sneezing, on the other hand, just became worse. No, these aren't problems. It's a stack of dollar bills. I screamed at the butler as I hurled them at him, but Vincent calmly said that I was the one who told him to replace all the house's paper items with cash. True. It's just that, when I suddenly became wealthy, I began throwing money around and misusing it. For example, I would use money instead of a napkin to wipe my mouth. After eating, I often like to wipe my face. I often like to wipe my face after washing with fresh bills. Vincent even stood nearby and showered me with dollars from above because I wanted more and more crisp banknotes. And in the evenings, I would get together with other rich people in my mansion and throw money around. How we had special toy pistols that we didn't fill with water or pellets, but bills. And then we ran around the house and fired them at each other. It's so fun. I love money, and I love to spend it even more. I love doing all the silly things with it that only rich people can afford to do. But now I have to avoid all dollar bills because something terrible has happened. I developed an allergy to money. Hello, my name is Sophie, and I'd like to tell you all about it. I used to ride the bus to school, which was filthy and crowded. I used to be envious of the rich kids who drove up in their flashy vehicles and tossed money around like it was nothing. They once hurled an entire pack at me and laughed for a long time when I picked it up and stuffed it into my backpack. It was nothing to them, but it was a fortune to me. But all changed. One day when my parents were able to sell their innovation for a significant sum of money and receive massive orders from large corporations, we made it to the millionaire level. I also started driving a cool automobile to school. I even had a personal chauffeur, and I made friends with other wealthy youngsters who began tossing money at the poor while laughing at them. They're so pathetic. I wasted money left and right. I went to cool restaurants, bought out all the seats of the movies, and special ordered the movies I wanted to watch. Well, of course, I replaced all my things, my phone, and started collecting cool cars. It was like I was living in a fairy tale. I got weary of merely spending money at some point. I was doing what any wealthy person could do, but I wanted to stand out. I reasoned that money may be spent as well as to put to good use. Napkins or a notepad, for example. I once came across an article on the internet about a girl who wore gold jewelry really close to her body. There's someone out there who knows how to make money. I decided to follow in her footsteps and address from big notes. Passerbys turned around and my classmates were speechless as I walked around in it all day. Even the other well-heeled children were speechless. I was able to outperform them all at the same time. Of course, I had to burn the gown because it was no longer useful. Other wealthy women fashioned similar dresses for themselves, so it wasn't unique for long. It's no problem. I'll think of something else. As it turned out, I was reacting to the ink on the bills. I wish I was allergic to chocolate or fruit. Even gloves didn't help because the heat just made my rash worse. But the worst thing was that my parents didn't use bank cards. Once they transferred a large amount to the card, but fell for the tricks of a fraudster who worked in a fake bank. He stole all the money, not only from us, but also from many other global people. 
A scandal erupted. The bank was closed, but the money couldn't be returned since the cards had been banned in our family. But I think that was stupid. When I became allergic, I got myself a bank card without hesitation, but I soon regretted it since I didn't really care about money. When I went to buy something, I agreed to all the points on the agreement, stupidly clicking on all the check boxes. I didn't even read the reviews of online stores when I ordered a new laptop. As a result, I was left without a purchase and without money. Since the card was wiped clean, then I had to lug a sack full of change everywhere I went. It looked so cringe, and people laughed at me at school. Everyone else made inane comments about me. Someone even tossed pennies at me since I looked like a beggar with my bag on. I became so enraged that I slammed this hefty bag into the most obnoxious classmate, knocking him unconscious. People began to get concerned. I was concerned about his safety. For my actions, he was brought to the hospital, and I was expelled from school. Even with my parents' money, the principal was unable to resolve the matter, and I was forced to depart in honor of the occasion. A celebration was held for people in a celebration was held for people from impoverished homes, which I learned about from the school discussion. I'm not sure why, but it irritated me, and I responded with a barrage of insults in the chat, after which I was permanently banned. Well, so what? I wasn't nearly as bothered by that as I was by my allergies. I still couldn't take a hold of money because I had a nasty rash. I had to give up a lot of entertainment because of this. Now I swam in a regular pool, used regular napkins, and even wrote on regular paper. But the most painful thing was getting rid of the money origami. I've been making paper Marvel characters for so long, realizing that this couldn't continue. I went to the hospital there. I was told that the allergy was curable, but it would take a long time. I didn't want to wait, which led to terrible consequences. I was prescribed a small dose of medication, but I decided that there would be nothing wrong if I increased the dose. So instead of one pill a day, I took three, and this led to the fact that I couldn't go to my new school. And here's why, due to the overdose of drugs, I looked terrible. My eyes were bloodshot, my complexion was bluish, and my mind was fuzzy. Because I couldn't answer basic questions, I was on the verge of being placed in a remedial class. My parents didn't understand what was going on with me and neither did I. My vision was spinning, and I felt so sick in the principal's office that I passed out and had to be taken to the hospital. For a long period, I had no idea where I was. The image in my head began to make sense only after the doctor's comments. I took too much medication, and I passed out. Everyone was concerned about my health, but I was still frustrated that I couldn't properly use money due to my allergies. I wanted to wipe my face with fresh bills instead of the dreaded hospital towels. Then I decided to deal with the allergies in other ways on the internet. I read an article about this cream that helped a lot of people. I immediately ran to the store for it. True, I had to stand there for an hour while the sellers slowly counted the change that I dumped. I put on the cream three times a day and took the pills at the same time, but in a moderate dose. And after a week, I was able to normally hold bills in my hand. Yes, this is genuine joy. I instantly ordered money to be poured into my jacuzzi. I savor my dominance once more while sipping milkshakes using a straw made of a $100 bill. But then I became ill all of a sudden. Oh. I attempted to exit the jacuzzi but was unsuccessful. I couldn't move or breathe normally. My eyesight began to whirl once more. I called for aid on a weekly basis, but no one answered, and my tongue swelled to the point where air could scarcely get into my lungs. Fortunately, Vincent was right in front of me. As soon as he sprayed the drug into my mouth, the reaction began to subside. They threw me in bed and dialed my parents' number. They insisted on summoning a doctor, but I refused. Apparently, the cream had no effect on me. When my parents departed, I told Vincent to quietly dispose of all the cream tubes, as it had nearly killed me. Everything would be gone in a few hours, I reasoned. However, the allergy and the mysterious cream had such a negative impact on my health that I had to stay in bed for another week. 
Everyone in my immediate vicinity was rushing to bring me food and medicine. Every day, a doctor visited and administered injections. Even going to the bathroom required the assistance of my maids. My parents had no idea what had happened to me until the results of the test came back, which revealed everything. The cream had ingredients that were incompatible with medications I was taking. It had no effect on me. After that occurrence, it was only hurting me. I put an end to my experiments. If it weren't for my stupid whims, then I would have already been able to recover and use bills normally. But now my recovery would only drag on, which meant that I would again have to endure sidelong glances of passerbys and their ridicule because of the bag of coins. But if it was somehow possible to survive, then the bullying of my new classmates bothered me. There were no rich kids there, so I couldn't make friends with anyone, and it would hardly have happened because I was like a freak, went everywhere with a bag of coins, and I felt so offended by this. Nobody wanted to talk to me or get to know me. Everyone noticed how much money I had, and the other kids were repelled by it, even though they didn't know me. They simply labeled me as a rich kid and attempted to avoid or mock me. At home, I sat among the coins, ran my hands over them, and reflected on how lonely I was and how no amount of money could make me feel better. I didn't have any friends. The rich kids stopped coming since I stopped playing money games. Owing to my allergies, and just sitting there like that was dull enough for them. Then I decided to somehow prove myself and started by persuading my parents to donate money to the school to renovate the stadium. And when people found out, some of the students, mostly the athletes, started to respect me. Then I bought beautiful costumes for the theater group. I was even invited to take part in the play, and not by a teacher, but by the other kids. I agreed, even though it was a minor role, and I was comfortable among the ordinary kids because they didn't need much to be happy. Over time, I was able to make friends with a lot of the students, and I also stopped having a strong reaction to the bills, and this again allowed me to freely spend money, but not on meaningless garbage, but on really useful things. I even gave up the money pool and brought some normal napkins back into the house. I didn't need to show off like that. So my strange allergy changed my life as well as my attitude towards money and people. How would you manage such large amounts of money? Write your answers in the comments, like the video, and share it with your friends. Hi friends, my name's Daphne. Something really scary happened to me last summer. I was arrested for the first time in my life. What's more, my crush was there to see the whole thing. Allow me to give you my entire tale of my arrest and what transpired afterward. For a long time, I'd spent my summer holidays with my grandmother and grandfather. They reside in a lovely beach town. I'm the only grandchild they have. Throughout my stay with them, they treat me like a princess. I have a group of pals there because I go there every summer. During the day, we normally spend time by the water. At night, we either sit around a bonfire on the beach or we go dancing. This year, some new people joined our group. I fell in love with one of them at first sight. I'd never been in love before, so I was wondering what it would be like. I understood what an intense feeling it was when I fell head over heels for Justin. The moment I met him. Justin would only come to hang out with us at night as he was working during the day. So I couldn't wait for night to come. I thought he liked me too because I was catching him looking at me once in a while. But we were only talking in a group and about nothing in particular. We hadn't had a private conversation yet. Justin stopped coming after a time. I inquired as to why his friend was no longer coming. He had started working at a cashier at a 24-hour grocery store, it turned out. He was working the night shift and returning home early in the morning. Then he slept for the rest of the day. When I learned this, I was really disappointed. The summer was almost over. In a few weeks, I will be going back home. 
Here I was, thinking of how I could get some alone time with him. And suddenly, I couldn't even see him at all. When I didn't know what else to do, I decided to go to his job. My plan was simple. I'd pretend that I'd come into the store by coincidence. I was going to act surprised to see him. I'd say, Oh, wow! I was wondering about where you had run off to. I don't even have your number. Give me your digits. Let's go do something before I go back home. If he didn't call me, and I'd give him a few days, of course, I would ask him out on a date. If he didn't call me within a few days, I'd phone him and, of course, ask him out. I was in love for the first time in my life. For the first time in my life. And I wanted to soak everything in. I started pulling my plan into action the next evening. I went to the grocery store. It was far bigger than I expected. At that hour, I anticipated it to be peaceful. Yet, there were lineups at every register. Justin worked at the rear of the store as a cashier. He was completely oblivious to my presence. I entered through the front door. For a while, I wandered aimlessly. There was also a queue in front of Justin's register. I decided to wait until it was less crowded so that I could speak with him more easily. I was pursuing the cosmetic section. I tried every scent there was. I didn't really need a new perfume because I'd been wearing the same one for a long time. In fact, I had just purchased a fresh bottle the day before. I grabbed my bottle out of my rucksack and sprayed it on my arm. I contrasted the aroma to those around me. I understood that mine was superior to theirs. Justin's register had opened up. In the meanwhile, I had received a tiny chocolate bar as a gift. As I approached his cash counter, I was really stressed because I was about to act and I knew full well that I wasn't good at it. Thankfully, I relaxed when Justin saw me and was acting super friendly. He stood up and kissed me on the cheek. Before I could say anything, he asked me for my number. I told him I was going back home in a couple weeks. Let's definitely meet up before you leave. I will call you for sure, he said. I was ecstatic since everything had gone so smoothly. When a queue of customers gathered behind me, I understood I needed to go. I was the one who had to pay for the chocolate. I bid Justin farewell and began heading towards the exit. The store's security guard stopped me as I was leaving with a big smile on my face. He wanted me to take out my backpack and open it. I shifted my gaze back to Justin. He was keeping an eye on things from afar after noticing something wasn't quite right. It was a truly humiliating experience. I said to the guard, You don't have the right to search my pack. He told me, You'll have to show what's inside your bag to the police when they arrive. Justin came over. He said I was his friend. But the security guard was an obnoxious man. You just started working here. I don't know you well. Why would I trust your friend? He said. Everyone was staring at me. I had to give him my backpack. Okay, then search it, I said. The security guard opened it and looked inside. He saw the perfume I bought that day. See, I was looking for this. I followed you because you look suspicious. You tried on so many perfumes and then put this one into your bag, he said. I bought this perfume somewhere else. You saw it wrong. I took this out of my own bag, I said. But he wouldn't believe me. He said he was going to call the police. They took me to a small room. Justin came to support me. I was mortified. I started begging. Please believe me. The store where I bought this perfume has already closed for the night. 
I can prove to you tomorrow that I bought it there, I said, but I couldn't convince the security guard no matter what I said. As we were talking, two police officers arrived. First, they listened to the security guard, and then to me. They were very nice to me. They said, don't worry, we'll help you. One of the policemen wanted to look at the camera footage. They took him to the security room to watch the footage. He came back after a while. He told me, you have your back against the camera. You seem to be doing something, but unfortunately I can't tell what. And I started crying out of desperation. The other cop took pity on me. Daphne has never committed a crime. She doesn't have a record. We can't really tell if she did this or not. Even if she did, she seems to have learned her lesson. Let's just give her a warning and let her go, he said. But the security guard kept insisting. Finally, the policeman had to say, In that case, we need to arrest you. Justin got angry at the security guard. I don't want to work in the same place as you, and this doesn't end here, he screamed. In front of my crush, I got pulled over. He was battling for me because he thought I was innocent. I began to cry once more, but this time they were happy tears. I wanted to encircle Justin with my arms and kiss him all over. However, I was unable to do so because one of the officers was handcuffing me at the time. As a result, I discovered that I had been arrested and had to be escorted to the police station in handcuffs. Justin joined us on our way to the cop car. He expressed an interest in joining me at the station. The cops, on the other hand, refused to allow him to join me in the police car. They told him, follow us in a taxi. We left for the police station. Me in the police car, my crush, Justin, following us in a taxi. We stopped after a few blocks. The cab stopped right behind us. Justin got out and came over. The officer took my handcuffs. The older one said, I've spent enough time in this job to know if someone's a criminal by their eyes. I don't believe you stole anything, so you're free to go. This was a total surprise. We think the cops and boarded the taxi. My feelings were all over the place at the time. I was mortified that something so embarrassing had happened to me. On the other hand, this tragedy forged a special link between me and Justin. I was already convinced that I was blameless. Justin, on the other hand, thought I was innocent because he trusted me. That meant a great deal to me. We decided to go to the beach that night because we had something very important to do the next morning. In a moment, I'll get to that. We sat on the sand and talked all night. I apologized to him for causing him to lose his job. Justin made me feel a whole lot better. When he said, I need to find a daytime job anyway, because I want to spend time with a very pretty girl to get to know her better. I started crying again. I'm not typically such a crybaby, but since I was having the strangest night of my life, it was only natural for me to act strange. Time whizzed by. Everything was really romantic. What more could I ask for? At the conclusion of our first night together, we even got to see the sunrise. We became so close as a result of this painful occurrence that we decided to become a relationship by the end of the night. So, did you figure out what we had to accomplish first thing in the morning? Yes. I was going to the store where I had purchased my perfume and proving that I had purchased it earlier that day. I was recalled by the salesperson who had assisted me the day before. I informed her of the situation. She apologized profusely. I'll bring out the sales receipt again. It has the date and time on it, but I will also do something else for you, she said. She went into the back of the store. After a while, she came back. She got the camera footage. She found the part where I was shopping and sent me the video. We watched it together on my cell phone. The footage had a timestamp too. You could clearly see me buying the perfume, paying for it at the register, the whole thing. I hugged Justin. I said, 
I want to thank you for trusting me last night. From there, we went directly to the police station. We found the officers that fake arrested me and later let me go. I showed them the footage. Right for trusting me. Then, of course, we went to the grocery store. The security guard that brought all this on me wasn't there yet. Jess and I went to the store's manager's office. He said he knew what happened the night before. We showed him the receipt from the other store and then the footage. The manager said, I apologize to you on behalf of our company for having hurt you. Justin said, Thank you very much, but it is the security guard from last night that has to apologize. And the manager called him and told him to come in. After a while, the security guard showed up. He couldn't look me in the eye. It was so much fun seeing him watch the footage. I took out the perfume from my bag. As he was watching, I was pausing the video to show it to him and say, See, it's the same perfume. Of course, my real intention was to annoy him. I don't know if he was genuinely ashamed, but he at least looked like he was. He apologized to me again. As you can see, within the course of a single night, I was unjustly labeled a thief, arrested, released, and more importantly, got myself a boyfriend. Justin and I are still together. Our bond grew even stronger. It started off as a summer fling, but then became a real relationship. Thank you for listening to my story. If you like real life stories like this, you can subscribe to this channel now so you can be notified about new videos. Bye!